Folks, welcome to the NYU IMGPH podcast. We are back with another episode. Today, we have a very special guest, Karen Isaacson Silver. Karen graduated from NYU in 1994 with a master's in public health, specifically with a community health specialization. Ever since then, wow, Karen has had an incredible journey. She started, she started her field in marketing and advertising at the drugfree.org. Uh, where it was more about releasing multimedia campaigns over time. And she transitioned after that into Sandcastle's LLC as a consultant, specifically in marketing and communications and within research. Some of the projects to name them are the Aussings Community That Care, which was more about community development. She's been part of the American Cancer Society, New York State Department of Education. And she's had a lot of experience within the Children's Environmental Literacy Foundation. Over time, as she ended her career at Sandcastles LLC, she took part in the Yonkers Partners in Education, which was college access for the lower income individuals. And finally, she concluded at My Sister's Place within domestic violence and human trafficking here in the city. Over time, she moved into the role of an adjunct professor at Montclair University in the Department of Public Health. And she's currently the VP and Director of Research and Education at the Women's Sport Foundation who have the agenda to focus on equity, access, and opportunity for underserved girls. And with 30 years of amazing experience and a lot of lessons, I'd love to welcome Karen Isaacson Silver to the podcast. Welcome, Karen. Good to have you Great. here. Great. Thanks so much for having me. So I'd love to start. I'd love, I'd love to start the podcast about you, your work and your research. And I'm, I'm, I'm so curious to know you're in the consult, you've been in the consulting space for a long, long time. And a lot of folks within public health want to go into that field. So I'd love to hear about your journey and what students can learn from you to prepare for their own journey and their success down the line in this field. Sure, sure. Absolutely. So I'm happy to talk about the consulting work. Um, but just to, um, you know, reinforce the fact that I really started um, not in the consulting space, but working um, in a major marketing firm and transitioning uh, to a nonprofit partnership for Drug Free America, which I spent six years at and really grounded myself in some really fundamental skills around um, marketing and communication all of which led to um, pursuing a master's uh, at NYU. So I would say that prior to my consulting work, that um, grounding right in the business world and in the non-for-profit world really set me up to have more focus when I entered uh, the graduate program. And then, of course, consulting over 25 uh, plus years gave me an opportunity to apply that um, combined skill set to a variety of different issues um, of interest to me all within the public health space. As you mentioned, it included everything from environmental literacy to um, access to um, college and career for low-income students, um, reproductive rights, um, and so on. Hmm. Okay. So uh, well, I'm, I'm curious to know what, what, what made you take the transition from the beginning uh, within from marketing and advertising into the public health space to begin with? Yeah, I quickly realized after about a year working on a packaged goods account that I could apply uh, those same skills and disciplines to mm -hmm. um, something that I was uh, more passionate about. And at that time, it was about um, reducing the incidence of substance abuse um, among young people. And so um, I saw very quickly how I could apply those skills in the public health space and um, found that to be um, a great learning opportunity and really learned about how to um, create impact um, using those skills um, quite differently. You know, in marketing, we were accustomed to selling products. Mm -hmm. uh, when I transitioned to Partnership for Drug Free America, we always talked about it as unselling, right? And really <laughs> understanding um, your target audience and all of the disciplines that go into marketing were very um, relevant and really critical for uh, conducting an effective public health campaign. So um, that work over six years really led me um, to NYU and to expand um, my work, not only uh, my skills and expertise, but also the opportunity to apply all of that to a variety um, of issues within public health that were um, of great interest and, and I thought were really salient at the time and ripe uh, for that kind of work. Wow. Wow. 
so what, what what could what could what could students do now to discover their path within within consulting or their path in general because it seems it seems pretty clear cut but you also went through such an extensive journey back then and to come to come to where you are right now so what could what what would be some uh, tips that students could follow or anyone for that matter in their career who are transitioning pivoting or even discovering their own identity at this time Sure. I think two things. One is to really have an open mind. You know, you only know what you know. And um, the exciting thing um, about this type of work is the opportunity to really uh, explore. And so mm -hmm. that doesn't just happen early on in your career. I believe it happens throughout your career. And you can uh, see from my own experience, I've had the opportunity to continue that exploration and that discovery and continue to build um, my understanding of uh, the public health space and what I could do to contribute to it. Um, and I also think that um, being multidisciplinary in your mm -hmm. skill set is critical. So while you might have a particular interest, whether it's in biostats or um, community education, it's really giving yourself an opportunity uh, to dabble both academically and then professionally in a multitude of spaces because there's so much overlap in all of those disciplines when you go um, into the work um, space, you can see very quickly that having a diverse skill set is really critical. So um, that means, again, you know, being in explore mode, both in terms of topics of interest, but also um, your skill set, your discipline. And that means really intersecting with a whole variety of professionals um, in the space who continue um, to educate me about my work. Yeah. I, I love I love the multidisciplinary aspect. It's it's a, it's such an interconnected world and so diverse that having the skill sets together are very important uh, within any field for that matter. That's that that really strikes a chord for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And and making sure you're not in a siloed space. So while you might have passion for a particular issue, it really does help um, to really expand um, your thinking. Um, mm -hmm. One, you have no idea what will um, you know ignite your your other passions. Um, but two, because um, the more exposure you have um, to uh, different professionals, diverse voices, diverse expertise, the better your work will be in whatever way you choose to apply it. Certainly. That's going to be that's going to be my tone for the week as well going forward. <laughs> the diverse the diverse aspect of things. Thank you. So I'd love to, I'd love to hear about the importance of health communication. Sometimes we see a disconnect in public health between the research and the outside world. Um, how do you find success in translating that data in, and research into simple, understandable information for the, the public? Sure. Um, that is the work that I do every day at the Women's Sports Foundation. So we mm -hmm. take evidence-based, data-driven research reports and translate them so that practitioners in the field can um, incorporate um, those insights um, into their own work. So um, no matter where you work, um, it's important not to have an ivory tower perspective. And um, to be sure, I work with folks in academia all across the country um, who do that. Um, but I also work with folks who really understand how to create those bridges between um, data and science and, and practice. And so um, at the outset of every research project, I really have that in mind as a desired outcome. So it's my focus um, from the get-go before I undertake any research um, in terms of the goals, the objectives, in terms of the folks that I bring on board as part of our team. Um, it's always with an eye um, toward the practical. And then of course, um, you don't want your research to sit on a shelf. So as you know, good as you may think it is, um, it's all about having tactical plans um, for outreach, um, distribution, communication, reinforcement, um, to support um, the research so that it can be really um, digested and, and used well. Hmm. What are some things that, that are uh, the most essential for that, for that digestible, digestible information? What are, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to use the word hacks, but some of your superpowers that you're using to have that, have that uh, message mm -hmm. that are power through to the people. Yeah. And if only I had superpowers, I would say that <laughs> um, we ensure that not only do we um, look to produce um, publications that um, really hold water in any academic circles, but we create different versions of that research for different audiences. So mm -hmm. um, to be sure, it's a lot to get through and they're often dense. Um, and so um, in addition to having a more abbreviated uh, version of the research and executive summary um, that makes it more accessible, we spend a lot of time um, developing things like infographics. 
and um, short, you know, media bites to incentivize people um, to get in touch with the research. Um, we don't expect everybody to read cover to cover. Um, we really want to make the data accessible and it's really on us um, to ensure that that happens. So whether we, you know, host a webinar, we participate on a panel, we showcase at, um, an, you know, at a, at a conference, um, mm. or we um, ensure that it's in digestible form on our website. Um, it's really up to us to make it um, accessible. As you know, folks don't have a whole lot of time and everybody has a different level of, of interest and investment in the work. Mm. And so we want to reach, you know, the greatest um, numbers of people possible. Um, and the other thing that we do is we bring um, individuals on board who can specifically help us translate the research into practice. So every one of our um, research initiatives um, includes policy and practice recommendations. And they're really um, conversation starters. It's not to um, be prescriptive in any mm -hmm. way, but to really lead people um, along the lines of using um, research and applying the data to their own work. Wow. All right. That, that, that's pretty, that is a superpower as well <laughs> over time. Um, how is, how is in your years, how is, how is health communications changed over years? You're, you mentioned infographics for the current, the current world that we're in. Has it, has it always been like that? How has it developed over time? And perhaps I'm even curious to know what, what might have, what may, maybe the, the skill that has always been the same skill uh, from from uh, 30 years ago to today within the public yeah. health space? Yeah, I'll start with that. And that's, you know, impeccable writing skills. Um, oh, wow. That has not changed in 30 <laughs> years, despite the fact that we have so many more opportunities to communicate in, you know, short pithy phrases, whether it's Twitter or, you know, um, through visuals on Instagram, your ability to write well and to be a clear communicator is key as much as it was 30 years ago, maybe mm. even more so, right? If you're given mm. um, less, um, you know, fewer words um, means they all have to be really critically important to get your message across and to have impact. Mm. So um, I would say, you know, really solid writing skills are critical. Um, they're critical today. Certainly we have many more opportunities um, and channels of communication to reach different audiences. We can be even more targeted um, in our work, it's really um, a wonderful opportunity to make sure that we're translating the research for the different types of professionals um, and audiences that we're speaking to. So I think there's more opportunity with that comes, you know, more work. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it's wonderful because we can make inroads today that we really um, couldn't, you know, 30 years ago because of, you know, social media. Yeah. So folks, focus on the writing. It's the it's the evergreen skill that will will take take role years for the years to come. And if you were accidentally sent to the past as well, that's a skill you will still need. Absolutely. <laughs> I love it. Um, I, I I'm I'm curious to try about the nonprofit sector. So a lot of folks within within the program and even in in other healthcare programs are 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 looking at the nonprofit sector. What does a traditional path look like in the nonprofit uh, landscape? And 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 can I, I would love to just hear more about that. What do people usually do to get into that space? And uh, what, do, what do you look for in that space? Sure. I would say um, there are many different types of nonprofits. There are many that work in direct service, whether you're um, assisting the homeless or providing direct service to students who are looking to shore up their skills for college and career, um, whether you're working as I did at a domestic violence agency and you're providing counseling or legal support directly to clients. That's one there are many models, of course, of nonprofits, but that's one model. There is the model of the Women's Sports Foundation, which is really at its um, heart in advocacy and research organization. It is not direct service, um, though we do um, a lot of programming and grant giving. So it's hard to um, say generally um, because all nonprofits are different, but I would say um, there are wonderful opportunities um, at the entry level um, to get a foot in the door, whether it's a direct service agency, a research agency, um, or, you know, a fundraising um, organization. And often those jobs um, come in um, research in programming, often they come in development. And a lot of folks say, wait a minute, I'm not interested in development work, which for those that don't know is really a, another way of saying fundraising. That's not my jam, mm -hmm. it's not my thing. But I will say having uh, done that work, 
that um, development um, as well provide you with an opportunity to really get to know um, a nonprofit and um, represent it to the different constituents that you're looking uh, to engage. So really, um, any of those spaces um, would be a wonderful opportunity to get to know um, the agency um, or organization that you're working for. Any um, foot in the door um, allows you to sort of not only do the task at hand, whatever you're you know, um, asked to be responsible for, but is an enormous opportunity to really get to know the folks across disciplines, across departments, to see what they do. Um, and that goes back to the whole idea of explore mode, right? Um, and yeah. I have used that throughout my career, and certainly when you're just starting out, um, really lifting your head up, um, talking to people. I don't even like to say networking. It's really, you know, being curious. You know, mm -hmm. why do you do it that way? How does that get done? How do you manage those challenges? Those are the questions that um, folks like to ask and, and people like to, you know, to think about. Yeah. Oh, so good. So that that's actually a great segue for our more um, uh, our for for the NYU students that are currently there, and I'm sure a lot of overlap will be there in this. But um, how have how have you applied your skills from NYU and uh, throughout your career? And I ask that to know. Obviously, there's a transition, but this might even give people value of things that they could do when they are currently at the school or even any other program for anyone who's watching around the, sure. the country. Sure. I think NYU provides an incredible um, foundation for this work. And I would say, um, and you hear this from lots of people, get to know your professors, of course. They're all doing interesting research and interesting work in the field. Um, but just as important, and this doesn't always happen as much, get to know uh, the peers in your classroom because NYU tends to attract a really eclectic eclectic diverse group of students, some of whom are coming right from undergrad, many of whom have been working in the field for many years, and you can learn so much um, from the peers in your class. So to the extent that you have any opportunity to do group work or, or projects or just, you know, interact with um, your classmates during or after class, it's really something that sometimes can get overlooked as a valuable asset during, you know, your, your graduate program years. Hmm. Do you have any do you have any stories from NYU, the, the people that are still uh, in your life from uh, from the, the graduate days? Yeah, I, I can't say I have any specific stories, but I um, do recall one project. We had to do a community needs assessment in Queens and I was not familiar with the geography of Queens and working with another student or two who happened to um, have spent some time there and really giving me sort of the inside scoop and understanding not just mm -hmm. the geography and not just, um, you know, the demographics, but really understanding community. As you know, it doesn't just come from the data. So I had a really rich opportunity, not only doing the work um, and grinding out the, the data points that um, I was tasked with, but really getting underneath um, a lot of that data in terms of community um, health utilization to understand the community just a little bit more. And I would say that's true of, of all of my work to the extent that I have an opportunity uh, to speak with folks. Um, that's the most valuable beyond, you know, all of the data driven research that I do, any opportunity I have, whether you want to formally call it qualitative research or just, you know, reaching out and getting um, as much intel as you can from people in the field and people who live in the communities um, that you're serving. And that's really kind of a very important underpinning of the work that we do at the Women's Sports Foundation is, you know, ears to the ground. We can do a lot of research and the data speaks volumes, but really speaking in my case, at uh, the Women's Sports Foundation to parents, program leaders, coaches, the girls that we serve um, is critically um, important and, and so valuable to the work. Certainly, certainly. What, what would, would, would there be anything that you would do differently if you went, um, if you went to back to school again? And you did a master's in public health. What would you do differently this time? I would love to do it all over again because you know what? The world continues to evolve and change. Mm -hmm. And we know that. I mean, even by the month and by the year. And so um, I would say that um, make sure you constantly connect the dots between what you're learning in the classroom mm -hmm. with what's happening um, out the window. Um, and again, I still um, try to apply that um, to my own work now, but I think as a student, sometimes you can get mired, right, in your classwork and your coursework, and it's, you know, nose to the grindstone, and I really do think that looking out the window and, and reading and listening mm -hmm. and trying to understand um, how what you're learning relates to all things that are happening 
um, currently is is really um, important. And um, I would say, yeah, I probably should have done that more. Okay, good to know as well. I, I'm I'm in my first semester. I will also connect the real world to the <laughs> to the to the learnings. A good a good balance of that. Excellent. Um, I uh, let's let's uh, let, let's transition again. So. I, we, we, we spoke we spoke a bit about the nonprofit space but I'd like to dive in and, and niche down a little bit more into that so the, the folks that are that are planning to go into the nonprofit space and uh, who are who are at the school and they're really 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 interested what should they do in school today uh, to to get into that space and what should they be thinking about sure I would say first you know the folks who are most accessible to you at the moment are your professors mm -hmm. so take the time um, outside of class to get to know them and to get to know their work and to get to know their career paths. It's just, you know, they're right there, um, they're accessible and they're usually very welcoming, right, of those opportunities. Um, obviously we know that having internships and internship placements are a really um, important um, part of the learning process. So any opportunity, whether it's a full on full semester internship or you just have an opportunity to dabble a little bit, like go easy on yourself, it's okay. You know, sometimes spending three days at an organization to get to know it or to volunteer um, is a wonderful way um, to take a peek um, at something new. So um, whether you have um, a full credit internship or um, you're volunteering, um, explore mode again, take a look. This is a good opportunity to see the kinds of things that pique your interest. Um, and in the process, of course, you, you are making um, connections. Um, and then do a lot of reading. I mean, I don't think, um, you know, there's anything more important than going beyond your classroom and your community to see what's happening, you know, across um, community, across the country and really um, across the globe. Um, mm -hmm. So continue um, to be a really good consumer um, mm -hmm. of all that's happening in the public health space. It can feel overwhelming. It's not to say it's, you know, something you need to do every day. But um, I think that um, those are some of the most important tips, you know, that that I can think of. Got it. So you you have had you have had such a great diverse background and awesome experiences and contributing to the community. It's 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 truly it's truly great to hear all, all of this. Where where do you find the inspiration uh, to do this every day and go? This is the work I do every day, and you know, stand up headstrong and and do such wonderful things. Yeah, I mean, there's so much need in the world, right? And so um, it's overwhelming to all of us. So I think if you have the opportunity through your professional work uh, to make a difference, to make an impact, um, it's a real privilege, right? And I really look at it that way. So um, to combine, you know, career with trying to, to make some difference in the world is, um, you know, an enormous opportunity and I don't take it lightly. Um, I work with a lot of people who also work um, in the corporate sector. In fact, um, a lot of those people are my close colleagues and supporters of the work um, that I've done over the years. And so it's really an opportunity also to share with other people who don't work in public health, who don't work um, in the not-for-profit space, to help other people connect their work, their professional skill sets with um, the needs that we're addressing. So um, it's a great way to engage other people in sort of making the world a better place, regardless of, you know, what you're tackling, you know, um, mm -hmm. at the moment. So um, there are tremendous people, as we all know, doing great work out there. And if, you know, we can all play some small part, um, how wonderful. Wow. Thank you for all, all you do in that case. If, 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 I were, if I were to give you a magic wand right now and Every, every the public health space is 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 large, and everyone's in such in different pockets of it at the current time. Uh, what is one thing that you would like to a, a problem or something that you would just poof, it's gone if you had the magic wand? Oh to my do that. goodness! That's <laughs> a, I thought you were going someplace else with that question because my my thinking was around you know if I had a magic wand, how would I um, make the not for profit world work more effectively? And okay. um, I, I will say that um, if I had a magic wand, we would all be working um, more collaboratively together, right? Because mm -hmm. there's so many people and so many great organizations doing important work and no one organization or individual can go it alone. And mm -hmm. so I think to the extent that we um, can work better and more efficiently together, we can really um, use our resources in smarter and more effective ways. And I think, you know, social media, getting back to your earlier question, has helped to a large degree um, people make connections um, to other people and working in partnership. 
Um, so mm -hmm. everything that we do is so, um, you know, intersecting, right? You can't mm -hmm. really talk about the environment without talking about education, without talking about social justice and environmental mm -hmm. justice. So um, a lot of people work in, in somewhat siloed spaces. And I mm -hmm. think the extent to which we can um, do a better job of really um, collaborating and, and bringing our resources uh, together to address problems, we'll, we'll all be better off. Folks, keep reading, improve your writing, connect with everyone around you. The world is always evolving, adapt and always improve the skills. Thank you so much, Karen, for your time. Lots of words of wisdom, and I'm sure a lot of people will get a lot of value out of this, just as I did. Thank you so yeah. much for your time and for, for being a guest on our podcast. My pleasure. Great speaking with you. <laughs> Likewise.